Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Good morning and welcome to this live worship service on this 31st Sunday in Ordinary Time. My name is Pastor Kelly Wadsworth and I'm the transitional minister here at Alki UCC, an open and affirming community of faith carried by the Spirit until that day when the new heaven and new bring about all of God's people together in unity. If you are visiting this morning or returning after a time away, or if you are here for our All Saints Day remembrance and honoring the loss of a loved one, I want to warmly welcome you and thank you for choosing Alki as your spiritual place of practice this morning. This is work that we can't do alone and we need one another. We are streaming live from the sanctuary today, supported by our wonderful tech deacons, Bob and Shannon. Please keep yourselves muted throughout the service. We will have some opportunities to take yourselves off mute, so pay attention for those. The church handed out candle kits over the past couple of weeks, and so if you have one, it looks something like this. There's a candle and a base and there is a call to worship included with it. Please go ahead and take those out now and we will light our candles here very shortly. It is a way for our own homes to become our sanctuaries, honoring the saints that have gone before us. And then keep those candle kits after today because we will reuse them again for our Christmas Eve service. Today is also a communion Sunday, so prepare as you are able a bread and a cup in your own space. Welcome to All Saints Day in our early Christian tradition. Saints Days began as a way to mark the anniversary of a martyr's death. So it is something of his or hers saint birthday. By the middle of the first millennia, there were so many martyrs. However, it was hard to give them all their due. And so All Saints Day was established as an opportunity to honor all of the saints, known and unknown. And it has been celebrated on November 1st since 835. All Saints Day is a time to rejoice in all who have gone through the ages and faithfully served. It is a day that reminds us that we are part of one continuing living communion of saints. It is a time to claim our own kinship with that glorious company of apostles, that noble fellowship of prophets. It is a time to express our gratitude for all who have gone before in ages of darkness, who have kept the faith, for those who have taken the gospel to the ends of the earth, for the prophetic voices who have called the church to be faithful in life and in service for all who have witnessed God's justice and peace in every nation throughout the world. And so we rejoice with all those faithful ones of every generation, a great company of witnesses all around us like a heavenly cloud. It lifts us out of our preoccupation with our own immediate situation and the discouragements of the present. It is the knowledge that others have persevered and we are encouraged to endure likewise against all odds, reminded that God was faithful in the past, and we are assured that God will be faithful in the future. And so let us now light our candles, each in our own space. Let us now prepare our own bread and our own cup. Let us now prepare our bells and our chimes, and let us turn to our call to worship. Good morning. <clears throat> this is Julia. We acknowledge that our life is rooted in your eternal spirit. And when death comes to us, we return to that same loving light. Please ring your bells with me after each verse when you hear the music play. This poem is by John Dunn, written in the late 1500s. So please join me when I ring my bell. The church is Catholic, universal, so are all her actions. All that she does belongs to all. 
When she baptizes a child, that action concerns me, for that child is thereby connected to that body, which is my head too, and engrafted into that body of which I am a member. And when the church buries a person, that action concerns me. All of humanity is of one author and is one volume when one person dies. One chapter is not torn out of the book, but translated into a better language. And every chapter must be so translated. God employs several translators. Some pieces are translated by age, some by sickness, some by war, some by justice, but the, God, but the Lord's hand is in every translation. And God's hands must bind up all our scattered leaves again for that library where every book shall lie open to one another. As therefore the bell that rings to a sermon calls not upon the preacher only, but upon the congregation to come. So this bell calls us all. No one is an island entire of itself. Everyone is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thine friends or of thine own were. Any one's death diminishes me because I'm involved in humankind and therefore never send to know for whom the tell bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Let us now turn to our opening song. Please join me now in an upbeat, welcoming song. Oh, when the saints come marching in. Can we get those lyrics up? All right. Oh, we are traveling in the footsteps of those that came before. And we all will be reunited on that new and sunlit shore. Sing with me. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Oh, I want to be in the number.
The scripture reading for today. Good morning. The scripture reading for today is comes from Exodus 20, 1 through 17. It is an ancient story of how the Israelites moved into the community of God was calling them to be. Exodus 20. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but love, showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses God's name. Remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son nor daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land of the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testament against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, their family or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God indeed for God's living word that reaches through the ages and asks us, how shall we live together? I'm going to read out loud for us three famous preambles. And I want you, if you know the answers to where they came from, I want you to put it in the chat. You're also welcome to just have a guess, a wild guess. Uh, as to where it may have come from. Okay, here is the first one. This is the preamble to a larger document. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Russ was number one with his guess, and spoiler alert, yes, the answer is the U.S. Constitution. Very nice. I wish if we were in person, we could throw our Halloween candy to the winner. So imagine I, you received a Twix bar. Okay, <laughs> number two, same thing. If you know the answer, put it in the chat, or if you have a, any kind of a guess. We recognize the inherent dignity and the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family. And it is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. It is one that is not as familiar. Cinda and Russ both guessed the UN Charter, and that's very, very close. Julia Chase did get it right. It is the Universal Human Rights Declaration from the UN. The UN Charter actually has a separate preamble. So this is the preamble to the specific document that is called the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. That was signed in 1948. Okay, last one. We, the people, grateful for divine guidance and mindful of our heritage and our uniqueness as this state, dedicate our efforts to fulfill our philosophy, which is decreed in our motto, Ua Mawa 
K-A-O-Kai Ania I Kepono. The life of the land is perpetuated in righteousness. Any guesses? That is the preamble to the state constitution for the state of Hawaii. And so they, they utilize um, Hawaiian in their state constitution. And I love how it is translated, their motto is translated the life of the land is perpetuated in righteousness. A lovely way to put it. These preambles are, are the ways that we really set down our intentions and our vision for how we want to be. They are indeed um, ideals. They, they are the best of what we can ever imagine to live up to. And as that, they shape us. They shape us to know what are our habits? What are our thoughts that we should keep in order to keep living into that? What are our habits, our thoughts, our ideas that we need to discard and get rid of? Because they keep us from arriving at that place. And the Ten Commandments, which Julia read today, are very much like the preamble for all of Israel's work together. It starts off, before it even gets to the first commandment, it starts off with something of a preamble to the preamble. And it starts off, God spoke all these words. I am God, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of a life of slavery. That's the preamble. It will be a preamble that's going to show up in the prophets, in later books in the Old Testament. It's going to show up as Jesus wrestles with his own day and age. It shows up over and over that this is the foundational work that in order to achieve freedom, we have to remember where we have come from and remember what it's like to not have it. If you are just joining us, we have been in the book of Exodus for a number of weeks and we are nearing the end because the Ten Commandments are part of the culmination of the Israelites' work. They had reached a place in their life in Egypt where it was no longer tolerable and so they left through a series of plagues, through the leadership of Moses. They departed. It was not a simple or an easy departure. There was something of a military battle. They had to travel. They, they were not sure of their own survival. They arrived in the wilderness, which was a desert-like scenario. And in that desert, they had to unlearn the habits of oppression. What's sobering is that it took them a generation. And it would be the ones who were born in the desert, in the wilderness, who would lead them into the promised land. They had to shed themselves of the habits of getting ahead by stepping on one another. They had to be retrained. They had these experiences. One was manna, and that was, that was a lesson in gathering enough for the day but not storing up more than one needs. So it was a foundational piece about how does everyone in this community be provided for and how do we make sure that everyone has what they need. There was another case where with a similar issue with water, then they had a third fairly important trial where Moses, who had been leading them all along, was working on these Ten Commandments, was up on a mountain, was communing with God, was really working through what their foundation was going to be as a people. And the people said, it's taking too long. We're, we're not going to do it. We're, we're not going to go that direction. We know we left slavery, but we think we might die in the desert. We think it might just be better to not, to, to stop the pursuit of these far off ideals and it might just be better to cut our losses and stick here. And so in that 
there was a case of a golden calf. It was an idol. It, it was the temptation of wanting to st stop too soon and say, it can't be done. The, the, the community that we want can't be done. So we're going to stop short and we're going to go with what we've got. Moses getting is in the process of etching these Ten Commandments into stone. And so he comes down and sees this golden calf situation and he's angry. He's like, well, we've come so far. So let's not give up now. So these Ten Commandments, this is a turning point. They've left Egypt. They've arrived in the desert. They've done the desert work. They've done their wilderness tasks. They've been there for years. It's been a generation. They've worked out of their system some of their habits from oppression, and they have now begun to craft a positive vision forward, not just a not Egypt or a not oppression vision forward, but now this, this is the first time they've got a real solid grasp of what is the thing that we are trying to do? What is the community that God is calling us to be? And so this is where we encounter them today. And this is where we will stay for this week and next week. And then it'll be the People's Liturgy, the third Sunday in November. So we're going to stay here because this is a foundational document that is an important one. Um, it's not important in that it's, it's exactly something that can never be changed but it is the product of the ethical work of the people, taking what they have learned and putting it into play so that they might find a better way to be together, that they might be able to live into their spirit into which God calls them to be. When we look at these 10 commandments, they've got this preamble that I just read that you shall have I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of a life of slavery. Full stop. That is going to be the spirit and the ethos and the morality that is going to guide them. That they remember what it's like to not have freedom, to not be a community that is united, to not take care of one another. They're going to remember what that's like so that they can know that what they have and what they are building is worthwhile, that it is indeed a call from God. When we get into the Ten Commandments themselves, there's a couple of different ways we can understand them. There's eight of them that are written originally in a negative form, like a don't do this. And then there's two of them that are written in a do this. There's another way to remember them. And the first four are something of God-oriented commandments. And then five, numbers five through 10 are more, how do we relate to one another? And as that, in these commandments, they're not designed for the private welfare of the citizens, although that is a piece of what happens when the community itself is healthy. It is designed for the health of the whole community. The commandments themselves focus on the outer limits of our conduct and our behavior rather than the real specifics. There will be a time and a place for real specific laws that Israel will come up and craft and, and address the specific kinds of challenges that come her way. But this is still, we're still in preamble land. So this is a statement on how we live together well. I hope this week you'll get a chance to read over it a few times because it's a pretty powerful understanding. Like they, they, they grasp a lot about human nature. There's this way that the purpose of it is so that humanity might live fully into what she was designed to be. It's not meant to be restrictive rules. It's actually meant to be a source of freedom so that we can become that which we are designed to become. There's a number of modern situations that it does not necessarily address well, but it was never meant to be a closed canon. It was meant to be an open document that guides and shapes us throughout the ages. Numbers one through four 
You shall have no other gods. You shall not make any idols. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord. And you shall remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Those are all the ways that we orient ourselves to the holy and to the sacred. And when we do that, we then set ourselves on a path of continued growth, continued maturity, and our development continues along because we are oriented in that way. Numbers 5 through 10 become some real specifics in how we relate to one another. Honor your father and your mother. Do not commit murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not lie and do not covet. And when we look at this, we begin to see that it's actually fairly comprehensive. It's a fairly comprehensive understanding of that ancient life of what are the things that if we can keep everyone from doing, we are all going to be better off. There's a certain way that these Ten Commandments are particularly relevant in our own time and place. It's November 1st. If you haven't experienced some of the current cultural anxiety that we're all living in, some of the stress, some of the pressure of this upcoming Tuesday and the election day, um, then I have to tell you I am envious because I feel it every time I open the paper, every time I turn on the news. You can feel it. We, we are swimming in anxiety that is so thick it feels like you could cut it with a knife. What if we take some time to remember that our preamble, our most original and authentic allegiance is to our spiritual tradition and the spiritual preamble of the Ten Commandments, that that is our original shaping and that is our original formation of the community that we understand and we are trying to be. That I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of slavery. How might we translate that today? I am the Lord your God who desires freedom for you and not oppression. I am the Lord your God who desires to unhook you from all the things that pull you down from all the things that prevent you from becoming the whole person I have designed you to be. There's a speaker, uh, like a, a speaker who, who goes to churches and talks about these kinds of things, and she calls them gremlins. Uh, there are these gremlins that come into our lives, and that is the source sometimes, that is the source of some of our internal oppression, that we allow voices to tell us things that, are not true, and just not not true, but prevent us from a life of fullness and a life of freedom. So let us mark today as a day where our preamble, our foundational document starts with, I am the Lord your God, who has freed you and desires to continue freeing you and bringing you out of those places where you are oppressed. Alleluia and Amen. Alleluia and Amen. In the midst of new dimensions, in the face of changing ways, who will lead the pilgrim people wandering in their separate ways? Blood of rainbow, fiery billow, bleeding with the eagle sword. Let us now prepare our hearts and turn our attention to our remembrance for our saints. Please pray with me. Holy One, you continue to knit us together in the eternal mystery of your saints. 
you knit us together into the communion of all those who have gone before. And we stand on the shoulders of such tremendous giants, of such saints who have been faithful in all manner of circumstances, challenging ones, unexpected ones, dark ones. We remember the, our beloved family and friends who have passed on and who have gone on before us. And we ask that you would give us the strength to run the journey that you have set out before us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This poem by Marjorie Wentworth. Whether it is morning, the sunlight is peeping through overlapping oak branches bursting with bright leaves, or late in the day after rain has fallen and the scent of spring splashes across the washed sky, emptied of clouds. And hoping you have arrived at this sanctuary where the locked church door is never closed to anyone. Step into the circle of grace woven from many threads that bind us across time and place. Let us warm, mourn together the thousands upon thousands who have perished, so many alone, so many afraid. So far from the people they loved most, perhaps you or someone you know, cousin, co-worker, neighbor, or friend. 100,000 stories left to tell, 100,000 voices suddenly silent, 100,000 names etched on the altars of our hearts. Our grief is collective, tear stained and bright, blue like a wolf for the wind, wrapping itself around you as you step back into the world the names of the lost are tumbling through the sky. Amen. Amen. Let us now sing together for all the saints, verses one through three.
Bob Jackson, Jim Connor. Nancy K. Van Wick. Alan Bellier. Nina Hughes. Anne Brzezinski. Diane Pietro D'Angelo. Sue Blauert Grimm. Virginia Cooper. Jim Hansen. Russell Nolte. Tim Hansen. Joyce Palmer. And from our chat box, Maya Maya Yin. Beloved, you are surrounded by great and good companions who witness and who run the race before you, now cheering you on, inspire you with their courageous faith, with witnesses running beside you, churning up the dust of this well-traveled path, encouraging you with the steady beat of their beautiful feet. Run, beloved, run. Lay aside every weight, every worry, every weak thing that you have trusted more than God. Lay them aside and run. Run, beloved, run. Run with the perseverance, the race, daring, enduring, and alive, looking not to the dust, but to Jesus, the perfecter and pioneer of our faith. Look not to the right and not to the left, but let us look to Jesus. Let us take it up and run until we sit down in the next life. Let us not grow weary or lose heart, for the strongest step is yet to come. Let us now close this time with the final two verses of For All the Saints with the lyrics available on the screen.
and their hearts are brave again and their faith grows strong. Let us turn to our communion, one of our practices, one of our rituals that a very core element of it is that it connects us to a world that is so much bigger than us. It connects us not just to the layers of spirit and the layers of sacred in our own lives, but it connects us through all the saints of history and all those who will come to whom we one day will all pass the baton. God of surprises, you call us from the narrowest of our traditions to new ways of being church, from captives of our culture to creative witnesses for justice, from the smallness of our horizons to the bigness of your vision. Clear the way in us, your people, that we, we might call others to freedom and be renewed in our faith. Jesus, wounded healer, call us from the preoccupation with our own histories and our own hurts to the daily task of peacemaking, to the daily task of partnership and pilgrimage to inclusive community. Clear the way in us that we might call others to wholeness and to integrity. Holy transforming spirit, you call us to faithfulness, from clutter to clarity, from desire to control to a deeper trust, from the refusal to love to a readiness to risk. Clear the way in us, your people, that we might know your beauty and your power from the gospel that you have given us. I invite you as we partake of the bread and the cup to put what you are using in the chat box and then we include those in our closing prayer so it can be whatever you are using whatever sustenance the lord has provided for you in your space of living this morning the bread and the cup are indeed the mundane elements of our life made sacred by god's spirit on the night that jesus died he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us all together now partake of the bread, one united with the other until we physically are back together again. Please partake now. In the same way, he took the cup and he poured it out and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. Whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Sisters and brothers, whatever the cup may be in your own space today, it may be something common. It may be something you've had around for a long time, but let it be something sacred that that is indeed how the spirit comes to us through our lives, through the day-to-day -day parts of our lives. Let us partake together. Please pray with me. May the Lord make sacred this morning a cracker, a triscuit, and a cookie coffee and water, sourdough bread and apple juice, Ritz crackers, apple cranberry juice, pumpkin spice biscuits and white wine, water and protein bars, pomegranate juice and water crackers, plum cake and tea, red wine and Velveeta, coffee, bread, toasted Hawaiian bagel and orange juice, orange glazed cinnamon roll and pomegranate juice, gluten-free dairy-free crackers, with red wine and multi-grain crackers with chai tea, the common elements of our life. But they become very uncommon when the deepest spirit touches them and allows us to see through them into the deeper layers of the ways that we are called to be a spirit people, the ways that after it all, we indeed are a unified people, not just with one another, but with all those on this planet that we live in together. 
We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us now turn to our time of offering. Our mission is to engage. Oops. There we go. Our mission is to engage in God's mission to feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, and wipe the tears from every eye. This accomplished. This is accomplished through our gifts of time, talent, and treasure. Give generously so that God's will might be done on earth as it is in heaven. Please don't. Donate generously through the PayPal link on the website, through a mail donation to the church office, or through text to give by texting Alki UCC to 44321, and a donation link will come back to you. Your support for Alki is part of a living and thriving heritage as the church embraces her third act and is the place where we find our spiritual nurture and home. This piece of music for the offering is called Hear My Prayer by Moses George Hogan. This is one that we do with the choir. So choir, I invite you to sing your parts along with me at home. I'll be singing the alto part. <laughs> Oh, she's Let's try that again. <laughs> Sorry. Let us pray. Let me, God, we are your people. We carry your presence. Use us and our gifts to accomplish your mission in the world. Multiply our effort to meet every need. This we pray in the name of Christ, whom with you and the Holy Spirit reign in our hearts and lives. One God now and forever. Amen. Hello, this is Emily. I'm representing the Church Council. The general job of the Church Council is to be responsible for supporting the spiritual and financial health of the Church, 
as well as directing the church's mission, strategic planning, and policy making. There are four officers on the council, six ministry teams, and one person at large, all elected. And then we have the pastor and the operation manager as a ex officio. We've been really busy. Um, we used five sessions to discuss creating a healthier church family. Now we are using a section of our communication covenant at the beginning of every meeting to reinforce good communication and good health. We are facilitating, uh, working on our future story, which will probably continue uh, three to five years. We are working with the personnel committee on the annual pastor review. We are developing policies for the use of the COVID-19. Uh, we have a task force doing that. We have about 25 people entering and leaving our church every week, whether it's janitors or um, pastors or co uh members, et cetera. So we need to have something specific for uh, COVID. Since we have a lot going on, we decided to meet at least two times a month, have some shorter meetings. So it'll be the first and third Wednesdays of each month. And if we don't have enough business, of course, we'll always cancel and people will be grateful. So thank you all for participating. I really personally enjoyed um, having this kind of service today. I have some of my uh, cousins, uh, relatives here today. So I really appreciate the worship and music team. And I know it was really complicated today. We have a lot going on. To, so I appreciate the people who are working behind the scenes on all the technology. So thank you very much. Let us all turn together to our closing hymn. Hi there, everyone. This is Kim. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce Spirit in the Sky. Um, this is actually written into my will that I did about 15 years ago. And the reason why, <laughs> and it, because it's a celebratory song, it truly is. Um, we move from one dimension to the next. And I love Norman Greenbaum. But there's a story behind this. When I was starting off my career working in Olympia, when I was in my mid-20s, I had what my best friend Judy calls a God wink. And I was sitting at Fuji Teriyaki in oh. Olympia having yummy, yummy Japanese food. <laughs> and this came on. And I, it was something that uh, I had heard, of course, growing up. And I, it was just, I don't know what it was, but I felt this profound sense that God was with me and that I was going to be okay, and that when I died, that I wanted to go to the spirit in the sky. I, I just, I, it was a, you know, I've only had three experiences in my life that were really profound. Um, the most recent one was December 3rd, 2017, when I walked into Alki. It was the same kind of profound feeling. So it's with great joy in my heart and celebration of those who have gone before us that, um, sing this song together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. It was a beautiful introduction. All right, I'm going to try to cover all the bases of the band here. All right, sing with me, Spirit in the Sky. Thank you. 
Sisters and brothers, when the fight is fierce, the warfare long, steals on the ear the distant triumph song, and hearts are brave again, and arms are strong. Alleluia, alleluia. For all the saints, from their labors may they rest. Go in peace. Amen.